He was so good yesterday that we're bringing him back again today. Are my draft numbers garbage? What are the real stories behind them? Locked on NBA Big Board, leave to leave, and today we discuss my favorites. Let's hope it's real. It's all coming up on today's edition of Locked on Jazz. You are Locked On Jazz, your daily podcast on the Utah Jazz. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. How are you? I'm David Locke, radio voice of the Utah Jazz. This is Locked On Jazz, your daily podcast on the Utah Jazz. Leaf Tulin joined us yesterday. He was awesome. We ran out of time to discuss the guys I love. The Julian Strathers, the Bryce Sensbaugh's, the Kobe Bufkins, the Jed Howard's, the Amari Bailey's. Is Casey Wallace really the best point guard? These are things I told you we'd get to yesterday. We'll actually get to them today, I promise. We'll probably talk a little Anthony Black, a little Julian Phillips as well. And who is Isaiah Wong? We'll get to those, I promise. We'll do it today on the show. Yesterday's show is outstanding. If you didn't catch it every day or so you're already on it. I am David Locke, radio voice of the Utah Jazz, Jazz NBA Insider. And this is Locked on Jazz, your daily podcast on the Utah Jazz. Insight, expertise, geeky, geeky numbers, and hopefully making it way better to be a Jazz fan today, way better prepared for the NBA draft. We are free and available on all podcasting apps. We're also free on YouTube. You can join the community. Please hit subscribe, hit the bell button, join in on all of them, and be a part of our everydayers Monday through Friday and make Locked on Jazz your first listen every single day. Thanks so much for tuning in. I greatly appreciate it. He's back. Did I ask too much of your time? No, not at all. I, I can talk, like I said at the end yesterday, jazz basketball and NBA draft anytime, anywhere. Leaf to lead will be filling in for me. As we mentioned on yesterday's show, I s- decided that uh, it is too important an off season for us to not to, to go away. So it's, instead of where we, I go on vacation, I disappear. Leaf's going to fill in. Um, I also have decided that marriage, family, daughters last year at home before going to college are more important. Um, so I do still need to go on vacation, even if it's that important off season. So Leaf will be with you first here in late May. And then uh, for like May 22nd on in that week. So 22nd to the 29th, I think he'll take a Tuesday through a Monday there. And then he's going to be back with you, I think, about June 11th through the 19th or 22nd or maybe even 24th, right up to draft day, uh, which after you hear the show, you'll know why. Uh, it'll actually be better with me. All right. Let's get to my favorites. Guys, we're just going to run one after another. Guys that were just great in our numbers. Uh, let's start with Gonzaga's. I always struggle with his name. So we'll get it out. 6'7", 205, junior, so he's older. Julian Strother, is that right? Is that how you pronounce it? Julian Strother. Uh, On the numbers, and he's a junior, so I get a little nervous, a little older, 84 percentile in transition. No isolation. Uh, 77 percentile pick and roll at 102. That's a lot. 97 percentile spot up shooting on 117. That's a whole lot. 93 percentile catch and shoot, 62 of 142. That's really good. Unguarded, 72%. Dribble off the bounce, 71%. That's pretty good. This guy is projected where in drafts right now? Typically early second round. So why was a player with this good of numbers who I like this much a second round pick? He would be only probably for the Jazz 28th pick of the draft. Unless something went haywire and he went much higher. What, why is it? What's going on with him? I think the rationale for why he's lower stemmed from him being older. It's it, there's, there's tape from years past and, and he made pr- significant growth uh, in his junior year, which are impressive, but his greatest strengths, both by the numbers and in terms of, if you're just going to go traits uh, would be his shooting, but there is a big caveat. He has a very low release though. He is tall. It, that matters in the NBA. You, you rarely see a wing shooter with a low release really thrive, and that's what his role would be. He'd be a 3 and D to a T. And that brings me to the second point. Defense, I think he's fine, but I worry about scalability because Gonzaga plays in the WCC. They play a great non-conference, but a lot of these numbers are bolstered by playing opponents that, according to Ken Palm, are not top 100. There are a few that are top 100 in the WCC, the St. Mary's, the uh, – BYU is okay. You know, there's teams like that. 
but but there are teams that are very poor, and I think that's where you can bolster your numbers and make it a little bit, I won't say fraudulent, but a little bit misleading. Um, so I think shooting and rebounding would be his two greatest strengths. I think he's very good at both of those, but shooting comes with a bit of a caveat. I watched him play live twice this year. Um, I went to March Madness in Denver, and I saw him play against Grand Canyon and against TCU, and I thought he was – good but didn't stand out to me in person I, I i thought that his athleticism looked good comparable to other college athletes but he didn't stand out and i thought his shooting was very impressive especially against grand canyon but that has the the point of emphasis right here that's inferior competition for a guy who is a junior playing on a team that should win that game all right let's get to my next guy he's out of ohio state he's 6'6 235 pounds his name is Bryce Sensbaugh. He's in the 63rd percentile in transition, which is pretty good. 70th percentile isolation, which is really good. He is not a great pick and roll ball handler in 53 attempts. He was 38th percentile. 74th percentile in spot up. 95th percentile in catch and shoot on 120 attempts. 87th percentile in unguarded. And the number that really has me most excited, the second best off the bounce shooter in the draft. The only guy that's better off the draft was Grady Dick. You explained in yesterday's show, the everydayers have already heard it, of why that might be a little suspect. Bryce Sensbaugh is in the 82nd percentile on 128 attempts. Is Bryce Sensbaugh, the freshman out of Ohio State, is, where is he projected in the draft right now? He's all over the place. My, myself, personally, I've got him just outside of the lottery. Uh, let me check my latest rendition of the big board. I've got him number 16 on my personal big board that I'm planning to publish shortly. Uh, I like Bryce Sensba a lot, and I think he could even climb into the lottery uh, for as I watch more and more film of him. He's someone I saw a lot of, but he had spurts where he was very good in the middle of the year. And then his knee started to bug him and the stats started to deteriorate at the end of the year, eventually causing him to sit out a couple of Ohio State's final games. Uh, his game is very interesting, though, and it's almost like his predecessor at Ohio State, Mal uh, Malachi Branham, who was the 20th pick of this previous draft, someone who had impressive shooting splits, but he didn't shoot a ton of threes. He did it from the mid-range. Sensabaugh li likes to go play some old-school basketball. He's got a bruising body at 6'5 and a half, 6'6", 235. And he's 89th percentile in post-ups as a two guard. That's something you don't see very often. I, I like that about him. I think he'll lose weight uh, entering the NBA. I think that's something that teams will want from him. And I wonder if that, uh, this is, uh, I have no true pull on this, but I wonder if that limits his ability to create space. Cause I think in isolation 70th percentile as a freshman in a rugged big 10 is very impressive. His shooting splits are phenomenal. 95th percentile catch and shoot 94th and guarded, 87th and unguarded. Uh, that screams production and ability to score with athleticism and guile. So I, that's someone that I would be pretty excited about drafting. Uh, 38 percentile at the rim gives me a little bit of pause, but I think with a bit of weight loss, he might be able to gain some vertical pop because I think he's got the quick burst, but I think he wears down towards the end of game sometimes. That's Bryce Sensba out of Ohio State. We're talking, all right, this was a player who on the draft board that I had pulled – was 27, which I think is too low. Then I was listening to Richard Stamen uh, with Raphael Barlow on Locked on NBA Big Board, and he put this guy in, I think, the top 10. So I don't know where Kobe Buckin, the six foot four, 195 pound sophomore out of Michigan, fits on most people's board, but sounds like there must be some variety. 81st percentile in transition, 84th percentile in limited isolation. 92nd percent at the rim at six foot four on 121 rim shots. 72nd percent on pick and roll at 157. 59% of spot up shooting is not great, but might be teachable. 56% on catch and shoot. None of these are dreadful numbers. Off the bounce, 60th percentile, 107%. Tell me, where's Kobe Bufkin projected in most people? I think he's a, typically seen as a later first round pick. And the interesting thing about Bufkin is I, I truly believe he's someone that draft Twitter has influenced the perception of. Ooh, I, I, we'll pause there. We'll pause there. And Leaf Tulin will explain how he thinks draft Twitter has impacted Kobe Bufkin when we continue next on Locked on Jazz. 
Today's show is brought to you by Murdoch Hyundai, located at 4646 South State Street, also located in Logan and in Linden. The Hyundai lot of cars, just amazing. The Ionic won the Motor Trend SUV of the year, the electric Ionic. It's absolutely beautiful, totally got a little level of pizzazz to it, drives fabulously. We actually got one because it won the Motor Trend of the year. When you're talking about Hyundais, what you're talking about is you're talking about a car that gets you all the bells, all the whistles, all the safety features, and at a price that's absolutely reasonable. Go check it out at Murdoch Hyundai, located at 4646 South State Street, also located in Logan and in Linden. And email me first at dlock09 at gmail.com, and we'll set you up with that locked on every day or VIP meeting to make it an easier experience. That's dlock09 at gmail.com. Whether you're going to Linden, Logan, or whether you're going to 4646 South State Street, please email me first and let me know so I can give you a little insight on that. Today's show is also brought to you by BetterHelp. BetterHelp is here for you to give you a chance to get better. BetterHelp to help you get a better opportunity in life. If you've benefited from therapy you know what it can do for you to share sometimes to maybe understand what's going on. Therapy is all about deepening your self-awareness and understanding because sometimes we don't know what we want. We don't know why we react like we do. We do not know how to deal with coping. We maybe know what we're doing is wrong, but we don't know how or why it's happening, how we fix it. So we talk things through. It helps. BetterHelp connects you with a licensed therapist who can take you on the journey of self-discovery from wherever you are. If you're thinking about starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. One thing I think is super cool is finding a therapist is super hard. So one thing they do is you fill out a questionnaire, you get matched with a licensed therapist, and if you need to, you can switch therapists anytime at no additional charge. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to meet your schedule. So visit betterhelp.com slash locked on MBA. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P, dot com slash locked on MBA and get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp.com slash locked on NBA. Thanks so much for making Locked on Jazz your first listen of the day. Tip of the hat to the everydayers who caught yesterday's show with Leaf as well. I'll start trying to watch some of the draft prospects this week and start talking about them on Monday from my basketball acumen, not just my numbers look on things that Leaf is really covering this pretty well. All right. How has Kobe Bufkin been influenced by draft Twitter? I think the perception and where he's ranked on these boards has, has skyrocketed since I would say about early February because Kobe Bufkin started playing better for a struggling Michigan team who had promising start to the year because they had a very talented team with Jet Howard early on being seen like, oh, is he a top 10 pick? Is Hunter Dickinson, a re- returning All-American, going to lead them to the promised land? And they struggled as a team. And the one guy who shined was Kobe Bufkin. But as the team struggled, they were like, oh, I mean, the national perception seemed like, oh, I guess Jet Howard's a worse prospect than we thought. But draft Twitter, being uh, very dutiful, found themselves a, a gem hiding in playing sight. And that was Kobe Bufkin. He was last year on a Sweet 16 team, a kind of a defensive-oriented freshman point guard that, that scored occasionally but didn't do that much. Then this year, comes in and has 84th percentile isolation stats, 72nd percentile in pick and roll with good volume, shot pretty well. 59th percentile doesn't scream anything, but that's solid. And 81st percentile, uh, percentile in transition with the finishing numbers in the 90th percentile. Um, not only analytically is that really impressive, you watch him play the game. He guards the best perimeter option every game, and then he scores, and he does so by, by scoring at the rim. He does so in the mid-range. He scores from three. That's three levels. And – he, he doesn't force anything. So that's something that just watching purely from a basketball perspective, you appreciate his game. Do I think his upside is enormous? Not particularly, uh, but I do think he's a guy that you can plug and play. And that's something that's become undervalued, I believe, in both in terms of the draft and just the way people perceive the NBA. How valuable is a guy you could see being your, your kind of table setting backup point guard with some scoring potential? Uh, could he also play the two guard and be someone like, Emmanuel quickly. I don't think that's out of the realm of possibility. I don't know if he's quite the shooter that quickly was coming out of Kentucky, but I think he's a guy that's solidified himself as a first round pick. And I think everyone uh, that I see on draft Twitter has him as a first round pick. And I would say prior to February, very, very few, if any, including myself, I did not have him that high entering February. Richard Stamen took him up high too high. 
I don't think I'd take him in the lottery. I just don't know if there's enough upside. I personally believe a lot in upside. And if you're going to be drafting that high, it's because your team's not very good. So I want someone that can really change the trajectory of my franchise. And I don't see him being that way, but I have no issue with him going in the top, you know, 20, 25. I think I have him 25th right now on my big board. And I've worked my way through the batch of some film uh, of players around there. And so far I've liked him more than some of the players that I've watched that I've got ranked 22 through 28. So I think he'll somewhat be in that kind of range for me, but I don't, I don't hate that ranking. I just think that's a safer play as opposed to upside. And that's where everyone's philosophy differs. All right, let's get to a UCLA project is a, or prospect. Another guy who I, um, the numbers kind of like. They don't love, they kind of like. And that is Amari Bailey. He, they love the, his transition numbers, 81%. His limited isolation numbers are good. His rim percentile, uh, or his rim percentile is okay. He's not great on pick and roll, though he did run a few. He's not great on spot up, but catch and shoot, he is good. Unguarded, he's really good, and his off the bounce is active and there. Is there something here with Amari Bailey? The numbers at least would say to me, take a deeper look. Yeah, I think that's the way I'd describe it. Just take a deeper look because early in the season, and, and I'll preface this, this was someone that I was very low on entering the season. He came in as a lauded top 15 McDonald's All-American type of recruit, went to UCLA, and I thought he was overhyped partially because of the exposure that LeBron James Jr. generates for Sierra Canyon, which is where he went to high school. And yes, he was the, the, the older player between those two and the better prospect at the time. But I will say a lot of that just dealt with him being a better athlete than other high schoolers. And so I didn't see the shooting being very good, and I didn't see the kind of skill development that I typically look for in a guy that's being projected in the top 15 of the NBA draft. So the reason it's worth a deeper look is he's exceptionally quick. He's very, very quick. He gets to the rim, and his shot improved drastically towards the end of the season when UCLA desperately needed it as they were dealt tough blows with injuries heading into March Madness. And he performed very well on a team that had legitimate Final Four aspirations prior to his emergence. And then when those players that were, were really anchoring and, and pushing this team forward to those Final Four aspirations went down, they really didn't look like that much worse of a team due to his jump. So I think some of these numbers are low in terms of volume. And I think that his shot is a work in project, but you have to believe in the athleticism. And a, a former UCLA Bruin, and you and I had this discussion, is Peyton Watson for the Nuggets was a pick number 30th, where that's a, that's a strange pick based off scoring 3.6 points per game as a freshman at UCLA. But all of a sudden you watch him block shots out of the sky and run like a deer. And you say, well, maybe, maybe you take a project. So I personally have him in the mid second round, but I wouldn't be surprised if he's picked and, and someone takes a prod. Like when you said project that may have been unintentional or intentional, but I think it was accurate because that's what he will be. I mean, from a jazz standpoint, that's what probably if they end up having, if they end up using all three picks, that's probably how you use the 28, right? Yeah. And I think uh, I don't want to, push it in any sort of direction but i think a guy like julian phillips that you mentioned in, in this as well would fit that same build as peyton watson with limited production on a really good college team where he's a 6 8 wing defender who shot 80 percent from the free throw line but shot very poorly everywhere else and just has the body that have has scouts very interested i think he would fit of the, in that same sort of ilk of, of a guy like peyton watson and that's made me personally reevaluate the way I look at those kind of later stage draft picks because they're not going to contribute on a, a team that's a championship contender. If you're picking 28th, typically, I know the Jazz traded, but typically that type of picks a team that's contending. But what do, what do they want? They want a high potential guy, not someone that's super, super safe because you know what? What's going to elevate their franchise the most? Someone that pans out in four years or someone that's going to play off the bench a couple minutes a game immediately. And so I think it's the former in that case. Dan, for those who didn't listen last week when we broke down all the numbers, the thing that happened to me is that players lower in the on the draft board had better numbers than players higher in the draft board. So part of what we're kind of asking Leaf today is, well, who are these guys? Where are they projected? And then why are their numbers so good? Another one that fits into that is another Michigan kid, and that's Jet Howard, Jawan Howard's son. And Jet Howard is a six foot eight, two hundred and fifteen pound freshman. He's in the 80th percentile in transition. 
He was not great in isolation. He wasn't bad. He was just limited. His pick and roll game, he took 83 pick and rolls, 6'8", 215. Average at it. I, I just like the fact he ran 83 pick and rolls at 6'8". 86% down spot up, 75th percentile catch and shoot. And then on 97 shots off the bounce, which is about the seventh or eighth most of anyone in this draft, he was in the 79th percentile. That's about as good a number portfolio as you can have as a 6'8", 215-pound freshman. Where is Jet Howard projected? Jet Howard ha has a interesting trajectory. Early in the season, as I mentioned when talking about Kobe Bufkin, all the hype about Michigan prospects was on Jet Howard because he shot the lights out. And I do think he's a top three pick uh, in terms of just shooting. If, he, if, it was, if you're ranking shooters, I think he'd be number two for me behind Jordan Hawkins. That said – defensively, Jet Howard really struggled as the year went on. So I, I think he's commonly regarded anywhere from 15 to 25. I've got him 21 right now. Uh, I think Jet Howard has slow feet is the concern that I have. So the label 3 and D is yet to apply because he doesn't rebound or defend, but he can shoot the lights out. And he does it in a way I think is a more valuable commodity than that of someone like Grady Dick, who is take uh, who is seen as the archetypal th uh, shooter in this class someone who does it as a set shooter jet howard flies off screens he also had plenty of isolation possessions where he was thrown the grenade so to speak there's four seconds on the clock he's 35 feet out and he tries to make something happen and i actually valued that experience and i think he's going to become someone who's able to do a little bit off the bounce not as a top tier weapon but i, I he's someone i would definitely if available at 28 which i doubt he will be I would certainly like to take a chance because that's a really, really good shooter and someone that's got more skill than you typically see at a pick like that. Uh, defensively, there which is a pick, lot. Of which picks, which, what pick number did you just say that was? I, I said if he's at 28, which I don't think he will be. What about uh, six, 16 is our other pick, right? What, yeah, what about 16? 16? I would not be frustrated. I don't think I'd be overjoyed because I think there's guys with more potential there. That, and like, for instance, G.G. Jackson's, often regarded as being a, a guy available at 16 and i've already pitched him as someone i would take in the top 10 so i i think it really depends on how the board falls uh from how i'd feel in the moment on it but he's someone that i wouldn't be mad at if we took it 16 i just think there's guys with that are safer and more projectable than him immediately and in the long term because he's going to be a project defensively whereas offensively i really think he can he's ready to contribute shooting the ball already like he could have stepped in Dan, uh, Danny likes Anna. offensive players Danny's track record is offensive players get drafted right Robert Williams may be the exception Marcus Smart maybe I mean maybe he just likes players like Danny would probably disagree it says just like I have a disagreement with you about the way you view the 16th pick um but we're and we'll get to that in just one second uh today's show is brought to you in part by our good friends over at Nissan and the Nissan Aria and I need us to choose out of the guys we've take, talked about today, our electric player of the week. Obviously, they didn't play this weekly. But of those guys that I just mentioned so far, uh, Kobe Bufkin, Amari Bailey, Jed Howard, Julian uh, Strother, Bryce Sensbaugh, of those five players that are my numbers darlings, which would you want most likely on your Utah Jazz, which means that they are the Nissan Aria electric player of the week? I rate Bryce Sensabaugh the highest, so I'll go with Bryce Sensabaugh from The Ohio State University, closely followed by, by Jet Howard, as we were just mentioning. All right, that is our Nissan Aria Player of the Week, Electric. Aria is the, delivers on a combination of fierceness, elegance, beautiful, and strong. It's the perfect SUV crossover. The 2023 Nissan Aria packs pinned to your seat power. Premium intelligence, all in an EV, the all new, all electric 2023 Nissan Aria EV for people who love to drive. Shop now at, e at NissanUSA.com. Today's show also brought to you by eBay Motors. The right parts, the right fit, the right prices. It's eBay Motors. And what's so cool about eBay Motors is the price, is the fit, the, the, the green tag that they put on you. You tell them your ride. You add it to your garage, and then they put a little green mark next to every single part that fits. It's just like in sports, confidence is the name of the game when you shop eBay Motors. With over 122 million parts to choose from, you'll be back in the game in no time. After all, it's easy to bring home a win when the right parts are guaranteed. Get the right parts, the right fit, the right prices. At eBayMotors.com. Let's ride.
Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. It's eBay Motors. David Locke, along with Leaf Tulin today, talking about the NBA draft and our various numbers. All right, we're going to get – I've directed this conversation. We have one more player. I need to, two more players we need to talk about, and then I'll get you to wrap up with your thoughts about anyone we should have mentioned. Uh, is Kaysen Wallace out of Kentucky the best – pick and roll player in this draft for the Utah Jazz to look at? I think collegiately, yes. This is an unpopular take based off the metrics. I think Scoot Henderson will be the best pick and roll player here. I'm I'm in Thompson. But uh, for the track record that the numbers support, I would say uh, Casey Wallace uh, is the best collegiate pick and roll prospect. He's someone that is not a natural point guard, but developed into the best point guard for Kentucky. And he projected early into the season as a two guard, became the point guard. They became better, worked their way from basically a bubble team to the number six seed and, and had a chance to advance to the Sweet 16. And Casey Wallace was the uh, predominant reason why, in my opinion. I would say he's the most likely pick for the Jazz at nine, should they stay at nine. I think he's a guy who projects with a – very high floor and a higher ceiling than advertised because of the way he's developing as a point guard, which is the position that is one, I think a need. And secondly, and perhaps more importantly, something that is more valuable to the modern NBA is a bigger ball handler than a guy who's a defensively oriented too, which is the way he was built entering this season. And now he's become a guy who's a developing pick and roll guard who can get to his shot wherever he wants it. A guy with developing range whose real acumen is being a tenacious on-ball defender. So I think he's got more upside than people may perceive. And I think he fits right in with what the Jazz have building as a culture. Would he be there at nine? That's a great question. I don't think he'd go before seven. So I think he's somewhere seven through 11. So I, I can't promise it, but, but I would say I would not be surprised. What is a player cop for Casey Wallace? He's often likened to Drew Holiday. I think that's a little bit rich. I think it's a little bit rich, but really but rich. I want to give I want to give the the archetype that the people give. I I don't have one that I really love, but I think the people that liken him to Drew Holiday or Marcus Smart have the right intention. I just think that Drew Holiday is perennially underrated by people who who like the NBA. I think Drew Holiday is phenomenal, and it's hard to project someone to be that. But he fits the ilk of player that that Drew Holiday is the preeminent player for. Like they should idolize the way he plays, and that's the way he will want to play. I just don't know if he gets to Drew Holiday status or level. I always think say this about if, if you if you project me an Andre Miller, the next version of Andre Miller is Kendall Marshall. He never played in the NBA. Mm-hmm. Like that's an old reference. What well, if you if you project me Drew Holiday? Then okay, well then I can go to like Drew Holiday lights Marcus Smart, and then Marcus Smart light is somebody. Like, you, you're in the NBA. You're a rotation player. This is where I quibble with you when you talk about the 16th thing. 50% of players after from 11 on never become rotation players in this league. Like, if you give me the 16th pick of the NBA draft like the Jazz have, and you give me a player who you're comfortable, maybe not a lot of upside, but he's going to give me 10 years in the NBA, I'm in. I'm in. I don't need upside at 16. Nine, frankly, most of the mistakes are upside. The most mistakes in the draft happen – kind of five through nine. Like those are actually the worst, sometimes the the lowest hit rate in the league because you're trying to beg yourself wishing you were top five. And so you try to drop hoping your guy's going to be top five. So I, I disagree a little bit with you on the idea that like you give me something that's fairly certain. And like, I'll take Luke Ridenauer was 14, I think by the Seattle Supersonics. Kind of knew he was never going to be an all-star, but kind of knew he'd be a 12-year pro. That same draft, they draft Nick Collison. Like those two guys to me, like, I like those picks at that spot. See, I agree with that logic. And I actually, because I'm a total nerd, have gone through the past 22 draft classes. Well, then and... I don't need to do it because that was going to be my weekend project. So why don't you send that to me? Okay. I, I It's not a perfectly compiled, but I'll, I'll compile it into non just my mental state. But I'll, I'll, I, was I'll, doing, I'll do I was doing the last this weekend. I was doing the last 10 drafts because I think the game's changed. And I was doing all pro. I was doing MVP. All pro, high level starter, rotation. 
And the, the reason I agree with you partly on that statement that, that led us to this is because yes, there are players that, uh, that you like a Luke Ridnour, like you mentioned, some of that, you know, is projectable and can play. Well, people sometimes reach for that at, you know, at a higher stage at 16, I think the drafts and, and stats that support this have gotten better in the past 10 years than they have in the 10 years prior. And, that, and that's, you know, to be expected, there's more exposure. But the reason that I don't think it's necessarily applicable for Jet, someone like Jet Howard, that why I wouldn't necessarily be thrilled based off uh, not knowing the draft board is because defensively, he's such an unknown and someone that I think is a, a large negative um, that I don't know if you want to build so much on shooting when there's guys that are also good shooters, when he's a great shooter, but if he can't play one side of the ball and today's built on versatility, I think that doesn't mean he's a projectable slam dunk to play 10 years. So that's why I'd slightly lean towards upside there, depending who's available, which I know is, it's a vague statement, but we don't know exactly who's going to be. It's pretty there. fascinating. Like you're watching the playoffs right now. Like if you're Isaac Okoro, you can't play. Right? Like we did shooting on Wednesday on the show. And like those guys that are in the red area for me on shooting, like that, like that really concerns me. That really like, like it's cute that Isaac Okoro can play 82 regular season games. He can't, he can't play. Dylan Brooks shouldn't play right now. He cannot shoot. He should, it's cute, but he can't. And at the same point, like if you're Jordan Poole and you're getting put on an island all night, like it's hard to play you too. Like it, Kevin Herter's having a hard time playing in this playoff series, which is stunning to me because I think he's awesome. Like I'm super surprised how little he's played in this series. So it, it's an interesting, like which weakness is worse. I'll actually take the non-defensive player who teams are fighting through switches now and doing some things differently late in games. You give me a guy who can't shoot, like they guys who can't shoot don't play after April 15th. They just don't. I agree with you in that philosophy, but but that that's the reason I don't think he's like a slam dunk, like shoe in, you know, 10 year player right there. I, I think he very well could be. And, and one more thought on, on redrafts. And just, I think people get excited about this is you find gems all over the draft. And so if you have three cracks at the bat, maybe the jazz trade to get higher, but I, I've done a couple of redrafts and you've seen some of the best hit rate be from 20 to 30. And I don't know why that is, but like you said, people reach for potential early and they then they take a guy for potential late and it set team, like teams tend to hit at a fairly high level from 20 to 30. And so I just want to provide some optimism for Jazz fans that are a little pessimistic because they're like, man, there's a, this is a seven person draft. I've seen that floating around Jazz Twitter a lot. And I think there are seven really good players at the top. And but I but I would say there's if you got three swings of the bat, I, there's there's more upside than you'd think despite the numbers saying, hey, there's only 10 players out of the first round that are, that are still in the league after seven, eight years. And it, it's a fascinating subject. All right. Final name I have for you, and you can share any one. We've gotten a little long, but it's a Friday. Hopefully people listen on the weekend. He's out of Miami. He's not on any real draft boards that I see very high. His numbers are awesome. His size is okay. He's 6'4", 184 pounds, and his name is Isaiah Wong. And Miami won an awful lot, too. That would be my like my other point that I sometimes do like on players. 87th percentile in transition on 106 attempts. 79th in isolation on 59 attempts. I think that's the third most isolation attempts of any player that is in the top 50 in this draft. He's in the 79th percentile. Uh, 81st percentile pick and roll on 191 attempts. I believe that's the third most pick and rolls of any player in the draft. Uh, 74th percentile on spot up, 78th percentile on catch and shoot, and 79th percentile on pick and roll uh, off the bounce jumpers on 184 attempts. Isaiah Wong's numbers are perfect. Perfect. Where is he projected? I mean, he's projected as a second rounder in some, and and if some big boards don't even have him on there. And I think the reason being is he's older. Like he he's played last year. He was thinking about coming out. He comes back, takes an extra year. Uh, Richard Stayman loves Isaiah Wong, and he's been saying this for years. So I think he was ahead of the curve uh, on that. Isaiah Wong, for counting stats, people that are interested, he was the ACC Player of the Year this year, and the ACC is regarded as a basketball conference. They weren't necessarily the best this year, but that's a, that's a high award 16, a game 
39 percent from three four rebounds three over a little over three assists and a team that made the final four and won the acc so that that's impressive isaiah wong's kind of role in the nba that you can project is someone who has the ball in his hands as a sixth man scorer type and the question i have then is how often do you take a six four two guard who needs the ball in his in his hands often i think he can shoot catch and shoot i i believe that and he's a good athlete in terms of functionality like uh creating space defensively there's there's moments where I, I wonder about how that will translate because he's slender. He's he's of a slender build. So, I mean, I listened to a podcast the other day and Jamal Crawford was talking about like sometimes I was targeted on defense and I didn't even think I was that bad at times. And I wonder if that becomes the case because people are going to target the weakest defender, even if they're not that weak. And I think that's probably the projection because he's a guy I believe can score, but I wonder how he'll pro- uh, progress defensively. And when athleticism becomes at a higher magnitude at the NBA, whereas he was above average in college, but only slightly as a senior, what on defense this is, uh, how does he do in the NBA? So I think that's the reason there's people that are pessimistic about him. As I've watched more of Isaiah Wong, especially during that March Madness run, I have uh, raised him up my board progressively. I've got him in the early second round right now, but uh, I think analytically he's a darling and there's a reason for it. It's not someone that's just an outlier that has no possible future. All right. Well, he's going to be my version of uh, Kevin Pelton's numbers had Gary Payton the second one year is like the kid and gem. And he turned out to be dead right. It just took the league like four years to figure it out. So I'm going to, I'm going to go with Isaiah Wong as forever after I'm going to have my Isaiah Wong jersey on. Uh, we have talked about a lot of players over two days. Uh, do you have somebody particular you think Jazz fans should keep an eye on? They'll probably hear more about you about him uh, as you fill in for me coming up. I'll put two international players in there that are hard to read based off their numbers. Um, Rayon Rupert is someone that could not shoot the ball, but for all the reasons you, the Jazz fans complained about having lack of perimeter defenders over the past couple of years, he should be an ace in that regard. Um, and someone that said he's struggled with injuries and confidence being a 17 year old playing professional basketball. And recently in workouts has shot the ball very well. He's got a seven foot three wingspan. He's very young, played professional basketball for the last year and a half. And then his countryman, uh, Bilal Koulibaly is someone who plays with Victor Wenbenyama. All the scouts go there to watch Wenbenyama and very often are impressed with Koulibaly. And so this is someone that I personally don't know as much as I should, but I've dove into a little bit of tape and I'm intrigued. So I'll keep you posted the, the more uh, more I learn, but that's just someone to kind of think about in the late first round or, or two players to think about in the late first round. All right. Someday, well, you'll be doing the show. The other name we'd never mentioned on the show that's super interesting that's worth mentioning is Leonard Miller out of the G League because while Scoot Henderson's numbers in the G League are all bad, his are good. So that's an interesting little future little nugget that I'm sure Leaf will dig into. He'll be filling in. Oh, you do. Interesting. I kind of thought that's – I kind of left him there for you to do on the last little part, but I didn't tell you that. Uh, Leaf will be filling in in late May for me. He'll be filling in, taking you up to the draft. You can catch him on NBA Big Board. This has been a two-day Leaf Tulane extravaganza with all of our numbers. We'll actually start watching players next week. Thanks so much for tuning in. This is Locked on Jazz, your team every day.